All right, so here we are in chapter 43, of course, and chapter 42 is the first time that they go down to, uh, you know, the famine has begun. The seven years of famine started, and, you know, the, Jacob, basically, they run out of food. They don't have any food because there's a famine in the land. Their crops are failing. They're not, they're not getting anything. They find out that there's corn in Egypt, so they, you know, he sends them down to Egypt. They go and they buy food, and that's when everything happened where, where Joseph is, is pretending not to know them. Joseph is, is treating them as if he's not related to them at all. And, and of course, you know, he's the only one that knows. None of them f are able to figure out who he is. He looks too different. They can't, they, they can't tell and they have no reason to think that he would be in this position. And he's talking to them roughly and he's saying, you guys are spies. You know, you're here just to, just to spy out the land. And, um, you know, and, they, and they're saying, no, we're not. And um, trying to maintain their innocence. Like, we just came here to buy some food. So it boils down, of course, last chapter, Simeon is taken and he's saying, okay, well, I'm going to hold on to one of you until you can prove to me that you, you are true, that you're saying who you say you are by bringing Benjamin with you. He didn't say Benjamin, he said your, your younger brother because they told him about their whole family and he says, okay, I want you to bring your, your younger brother with you next time you come here. And in order for Simeon to be let free, that was the deal. And in order for them to buy food again, that was the deal, is that they had to prove their innocence to him. Now, of course, Joseph's doing this because he wants to see his brother. Benjamin is his, is his only true full brother. All, these, all of his other brothers are half-brothers. The they have the same father but different mothers. So um, Joseph wants to see Benjamin, and this is the way that he does it. You know? And he's also kind of laying into him a little bit for all that, that they've done to him, and they're, and they're starting to reap a little bit of what they've sown, and they're starting to, to be convicted and, and understand you know, what they did to Joseph was wrong, which they knew it this whole time, of course, but um, it, it's really hitting home to them now that they're, they're thinking, they're facing death. They're facing the death penalty for being spies in the land. And that's what they have to figure out. That's what they have to contemplate and be worried about. So they get sent home. And then, of course, you know, Israel doesn't want to send them back. And he gives up on Simeon as if he's dead. And he doesn't want them going back there because he doesn't want to let Benjamin go back. And now here we are in chapter 43. And the famine, of course, is continuing. Now, I would guess they had bought enough food to get them through the, that first year of the famine. And... You know, or the second or third or however long they were able to make it into the famine before they needed to go buy food. So, and it doesn't say this, but I'm just guessing, you know, however much they bought, they probably bought enough to get them through the season knowing that the, that the famine was real bad, that they would, you know, and they all went, you know, it was like 10 of them went to, to bring back food on their asses to bring it all back home for, the, for all their families and stuff. Um, you know, do I know that for a fact? No, I don't, but that would make sense to me. They'd buy enough to, to get them through the season. So here we are. The famine's still sore, of course. It's going to be going on for seven years. And Jacob is saying, hey, why don't you guys go buy some more food? And they're like, no. You know, Judah speaks up and he's like, the man told us that we can't go and buy, he's not going to see our face unless our youngest brother is with us. He said, you have to send Benjamin with us because he knows that Jacob doesn't want to send him. He doesn't want to send Benjamin with him. He's worried about him. He's, he loves him more than all the other children and he's worried that he might be put to death or might, you know, something bad is going to happen to him. And he doesn't want to risk that. Let's keep reading here. It says in verse 1, And the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had bought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy, the, buy, the, buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you, saying, You know what? We're more than happy to go buy food, but you have to, Benjamin has to come with us. And if you're not going to send him with us, we're not going to go down there. We're not going to waste our time trying to go plead with with you know, Joseph with Pharaoh's, with, uh, Pharaoh's man that's in charge of selling his food. We're not going to go and do that because he already said, you're not going to see my face unless you have your younger brother with you, unless you can prove that. And um, here we see in verse 6, And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? He's saying, why did you even open up your mouth and tell him you had a brother? Now he's just kind of angry at the whole situation. 
right? I mean, you can't control it. It's already done. But he's bringing up like, well, why did you go and do this anyways? And now, what's the point? And honestly, like I understand it. I do this. You know, I think everybody's probably guilty of this. But when you take a look at it, it doesn't change anything. And I would recommend, you know, the next time you want to, especially with, with spouses, you know, it, it's easy to get upset about things and be like, oh man, none of this would have ever happened if you didn't, you know, do this or do that. And just, and just kind of be bitter and lay into somebody because you did this wrong. If you never, you know, and, and oftentimes, and I could think, I could speak from experience, you know, there's things that, that, you know, maybe my wife has done that were innocent, that there's nothing wrong with doing what you did, but then as a result of that later, something bad happens. It's like, well, why did you even do this to begin with? It's like, well, you know, you didn't have a problem with it then. Now why do you, you know, all of a sudden you have a problem with it. But even still, even if it was something that shouldn't be done, you know, you don't need to keep on, on harping on it, hounding on it after the fact. You know, we need to be able to forgive and forget and let those things go. And it may be kind of frustrating, and, and believe me, I get it. It's frustrating when bad things happen, but it's not a good idea to be just taking it out on people. And whoever, you know, if, if they did do something wrong, they're going to realize it anyways. They don't need you just, just laying into them that much more. And this goes both ways. You know, wives, you know, husbands, husbands, wives, you know, when, when someone makes a mistake, we don't need to keep rehashing that. And, and hey, maybe things do end up getting worse. It doesn't need to be something that you need to continually, you know, beat the dead horse and go into. You're in a situation, it's the way it is, you need to, to just make it through that time. Just like with Israel here, you know, he doesn't need to be, to be worried about, you know, why did you even bring it up? It doesn't matter why. It's the, it's, it's the situation we're in right now. Now, what's interesting to me is that, you know, he's saying, why did you have to do this anyways? And they lie to him. They, 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 they change ex what exactly happened, and we'll see this. Look at, well, look at what their answer was when he says, um, he asked them, you know, why, why do you even say whether you have a brother? Verse 7 says, and they said, the man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words, could we certainly know that he would say, bring your brother down. So they're trying to defend themselves saying, look, he asked us straightly. He said, they asked, he asked us, do you have a father that's still alive? Do you have another brother? Now let's look back at what actually happened in chapter 42 because that's not exactly the way it went down. Now, they make a good point of saying, well, how could we know that he's going to say, okay, well, bring, bring your brother, because they wouldn't have known that. But, let's see where, I didn't have this in my notes, but it's, it's right here in chapter 42. He says, uh, and look at verse 10, because this is where, they're, you know, he says they're spies. Verse 10 says, and they said unto him, nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said to them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. So Joseph's just saying, and they're saying, look, you guys are spies. No, nope, you're spies. You're just here to spy out the nakedness of the land. But they're the ones that start offering up this information. And it says in verse 13, And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren. Now, did he say, Do you have another brother? Did he say, you know, Do you have a father that's still alive? None of it. He's just accusing them of being spies at this point. They answer, it says, And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. They gave up the information to him. And this is the, narra you know, the narrator of the chapter saying, And they said, you know, this is, this, is, this is what actually happened. This is the truth. What we see in chapter 43 these are the words of the children of Israel, of, you know, of, of, Joseph's, or of, of um, Joseph's brothers, of um, Jacob's children, when they said, because um, it says in verse 7, and they said. So it's true that they said that, but what they said wasn't true, as we can see from chapter 42. They were just trying to cover up for themselves. Now, that's not right either, but they were, the, as you can see this, they were the ones that offered up all the information unto Joseph. So, you know, they, they, they could have taken a little bit more responsibility for saying that. But regardless, none of it changes where they're at. You know, none of it changes the situation they're in. The situation they're in right now is they need to bring Benjamin. 
regardless of how they got there, regardless of who gave up that information and having this whole fight back and forth about it, it's going to be fruitless. But it's not right for them to lie either to their father about, about what happened. So it says in verse, uh, verse 8, And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. Now, we already saw in the last chapter, remember Reuben was the one saying, you know, if it, I'll, be, I'll take care of him, I'll take care of Benjamin, because they wanted to go back and get Simeon. And he says, you know, like, you can kill my children if I don't bring them back safely. Now, we, we talked, I preached last week about how stupid that is to be just making vows and to be making these types of promises, especially something like that. You know, if you're saying, well, you can kill my children. Now we see Judah doing something similar. Now it's not quite as, as, as extreme or as bad as what Reuben said of like killing his children, but he's, he's saying, look, I am surety for him. Basically, he is making himself completely responsible for, the whole, for, for bringing Benjamin back safely. Now, I don't think this is a wise thing to do either. This is unwise for anybody to do. Now, of course, there's a reason for doing it. Why would he say that to his father? Well, the only reason he's saying that is to provide confidence, is to try to give Jacob a little bit more confidence to say, okay, he's serious. Let him know I am looking out for him by my word. You know, whatever happens, I will bear the brunt of all of it and take full responsibility for Benjamin. And he uses this word surety. Now, this word surety isn't used very often in the Bible especially in this context of what it's being used for here, that he is, basically what he's doing is he's going to make sure for somebody else. He's be making himself a surety for somebody else. Keep your finger here. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. Because we're going to see from the book of Proverbs that making yourself a surety is not a wise thing to do. And of course, the book of Proverbs has a lot of wisdom. But turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 6. Just like with Reuben, you know, there's ways to get people to understand that you're serious. There's ways you can just speak in a way that's just, you know, they should be able to, to understand that what you're saying is, is sincere and that you are treating it um, with, you know, with your full heart or whatever without having to make these, these promises, without having to make you know, these vows or make yourself even a surety. Look at verse number one of Proverbs chapter six. The Bible reads, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. So we say in verse one there where he says, If thou be a surety for thy friend, and he says, if thou hast stricken thy hand with anything. So like, you know, you make deals with a handshake. So if you've stricken your hand with a stranger, you know, just a or with someone else, someone estranged to you, over regarding your friend. Saying like, you know, your friend wants to, to borrow money, for example. And you're saying, you know, obviously to borrow money, you need some kind of collateral. So when you buy a house, you borrow money from a bank. And the house is like, okay, well, if I can't pay you, they get the house. That's how it works when you, when you get a loan. You need to have it backed by something. So when you're making yourself a surety, you're saying, hey, the blame's going to fall on me. You know, some people, especially when they're younger, they want to go buy a car, but they don't have any credit and they, no one wants to give them money. Then they might get their parents or something to co-sign with them. Well, when someone's co-signing, you're saying, you're making yourself a surety for them. You're saying, well, I'm going to back them up. I will provide if they don't, if they don't make good. And that's what making yourself a surety is, is you're saying, okay, the, the, the consequences will fall on me. So if he's not going to pay his debt, I'm going to pay his debt for him. That's what, what being a surety is. And he's saying here, you strike hands with a stranger, you know, we make this deal. He says, you're snared by the words of your own mouth. It's a, it's a tra you've, you've, you've just trapped yourself. You have set yourself up. He says in verse 3, do this now, my son, 
and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. So he's saying, look, you've already done this. Now you've got to make good on it. He says, make, you know, make sure your friend. You've made yourself a surety. Now go make sure your friend. He says, give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. He's doing what, do whatever it takes now to get out of this. You know, make him sure. Make sure that he's good to go. Don't give sleep to your eyes. You need to work hard now. Make sure that you can just get out of this. Because it was a bad idea to begin with to get involved in that. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 11. So he's saying, once you've done this, you just need to do whatever you can to get out of it. It's not a situation you want to be in. Verse number 15 of Proverbs 11. The Bible reads, He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship is sure. Now, of course, that word smart, you know, you, I don't know if you guys remember, you know, if, if something you say, oh man, that really smarts. It's a real old expression. It's an older use of the term smart. It just means it hurts. You're like, oh man, that really, that, that smarts. It just means that hurts. So he's saying, if you are a surety for someone else, for a stranger, you're going you're gonna to pay for that. It's going to hurt you. But, you know, he that hates suretyship, that's, that's not, you know, getting himself involved in these deals, you are sure. You, you know, you're going to be just fine. You'll be established. But when you're not getting in, mixed up and involved and making yourself a surety. And these are some, you know, a few of the only verses that talk about this. And um, you know, I'm bringing this up because we see Judah. You turn back, if you would, to Genesis. Genesis 43. Judah is making himself a surety for his brother. And he's saying, you know, let all the consequences, everything's going to fall on me. It's just not a wise thing to do. You know, he could try to instill confidence in his father, in, in himself, taking care of his brother, without having to go to this length and just and just snaring himself. Because there's going to be no good coming out of making that statement and, and making these vows. No good is, is a result of that. There's no reason for it. Let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, And their father Israel said unto them, if it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds, and take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand. Peradventure was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the men. So now he's giving them leave. He's saying, fine, you can take your brother. But Jacob's showing some wisdom here now. And he's saying, well, take a present with you. And I should have had you keep your finger in Proverbs. Flip back if you go to Proverbs 19. Just one verse here. Um, oh, I could just read it for you. Proverbs 19.6 says, Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. So obviously, he's showing wisdom and saying, well, let's try to butter him up a little bit. You know, he's already been speaking poorly to you. He's already as your brother in prison. You know, and he's making these demands of you. Bring him a gift. You know, he's, bring him almonds, bring him nuts, bring him myrrh, bring him spices, bring him all these different things that you know, maybe he doesn't have. And these are, you know, this shows you that, you know, J uh, Jacob was wealthy enough to still have a bunch of this stuff even though it's not, you know, almonds and myrrh and nuts and honey and stuff, it's not like going to sustain you very long. That's why they're going to get corn and some real meal, some food. But they still have all this other stuff. They still have some wealth, and they have enough wealth to go and buy a bunch of food too. Um, so he's not doing that bad. He's just not doesn't have very much food. So he brings all of this stuff, and he tries to butt them up and say, okay, well at least bring them this real nice gift. You know, give them a nice gift to make him not be so angry against you guys. Bring double your money. Bring it back. He said maybe the whole thing was a mistake because they were all worried about the fact when they came back after they bought their food that they had all their money in their sacks. That it was still all there. Because they're, now they're worried, thinking like, man, they're going to think we stole this. Or, you know, how did this even happen? They had no clue what was going on. So he's like, well, just bring double money and more money. You know, bring a bunch of money with you. Bring these presents and just, and just lay it out and be like, here. And you know what? That's a wise thing to do. If you, if you, sin, you know, whether you sin or not, if you're in trouble with somebody, you know, and you got to deal with them, maybe you're in trouble with the boss at work for some reason. 
it's a wise thing to do, especially if you need something from them. I mean, they needed, they needed uh, food, right? They needed to buy food. Give a gift. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing sinful or bad about this. It's just a wise thing to do. Now, it's not something you have to do, but if you want to get on somebody's good side, you know, everybody's a friend to him that giveth gifts. That's what the Bible says. You know, someone who's real generous, doesn't have a hard time finding friends. Everyone wants, I mean, why not? Everyone wants to be around them. We saw even, you know, Jesus, when he fed the 5,000, you know, people wanted to be around him then all the time. And Jesus told me that, look, you don't want to be with me because of my teaching. He said, you just want to be with me because, of, because I fed you. You know, obviously, you don't look for friends by just giving them money. Those aren't going to be your true friends. But if you, if you need something out of somebody, if you, you know, if you want to make sure you get something, you're looking for that raise at work, doesn't, doesn't hurt in advance to, to you know, butter up the boss a little bit and, and give him a gift. It's a, it's a wise thing to do. This is what they're doing here. They're showing a little bit of wisdom by, by trying to get Joseph in, in a, as best of a mood as possible to, um, to, to work with them and to help them out. But let's keep reading here. So in verse number 14, he, he, you know, in verse 13, he says, okay, take your brother too. I'm going to let him go with you and go see the man. Because he knows there's nothing he can do and they need food. And this is the only place they can get it. Egypt is the only place that has food because all the surrounding lands are all involved in this famine. And Egypt was the only one that prepared because of the vision that Pharaoh had and Joseph was wise to have them set aside food. Nobody else was prepared for this. So the only place they could go to get the food was in Egypt. Jacob knows this. He decides to send his brother and, um, or his son. Verse 14 says, And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Now, this is a much better attitude that he should have had you know, from the beginning where um, we saw before he was, you know, now he's kind of more trusting in the Lord and he's just, he's just letting, letting it go with God and just saying, you know what, God? You know, hopefully God be with you, you know, and, and will direct you and have mercy. You know, pray that God will have mercy for us and that He'll send away your other brother and Benjamin. Now, when he starts trusting in God, notice how now he's bringing up the fact that he thinks Simeon's alive. Simeon. That he's going to give your other brother with you. In just the last chapter, he was saying, oh, Simeon is not. He's just saying like he's given up on him for dead. All because he didn't want to send Benjamin. But now that he's finally sending him, now that he's finally just trying to have to, just have to trust in God, now he's got that hope again. So he starts trusting in God again, the hope comes back that, oh, well, you know, hopefully he'll bring Simeon back. And, you know, because he cares about Simeon, but it's obvious that he loved Benjamin much more and was just given up on Simeon in the last chapter. Now he's not given up, but I, I believe the reason for that is because now he's putting his faith back in God to, to take care of him instead of trusting in his own protection. You know, we can try to, to watch over our children, be, be way overprotective of them. But at some point as they grow, you have to let them you know, grow up and do things on their own. You can't always just, just keep them on lockdown or keep them in a bubble and, you know, and, and make sure nothing bad ever happens to them. We have to have faith in God that God will allow things to happen for a reason, but trust that He'll be there to take care of them. I pray every day for my family that God watches over and protects them. I can't be here all the time. I have to go to work. Sometimes I'm hundreds of miles away. I can't always be here and my protection is nothing compared to God's protection. But we need to be able, in order to do things, in order to, to grow, in order for them to grow, in order for them to be, to be the people that God needs them to be, especially as parents, you need to let them grow up. You need to let them you know, move on to their stages and not be so overprotective of them like, like Jacob was with Benjamin. And really, he was just getting, being kind of selfish. He said, well, I love him so much and you know, I don't want anything bad to happen to him. He's kind of babying him. Let, let, the, let Benjamin grow up a little bit. Let him get some experience. You know, there, there's a lot of risk in life. Just going out your front door every day, there's a little bit of risk. Getting in that car, going and working and doing things. Going out and knocking on doors, doing, you know, preaching the gospel, all everything. There's a little bit of risk involved to life. But it's life, and that's why we need to just make sure we're trusting in the Lord, that our safety is of the Lord. And that we're not just completely relying on and, and being focused on just our, our physical abilities for protection. And just trusting on, man, you know, because people get, people get nuts about this, so they'll get all the security cameras and the guns and, you know, and get kind of freaked out about just being super duper secure. 
It's good to have a weapon. It's good to be able to defend yourself. Okay, it's good to take a little bit of precaution to, to, to ensure a little bit of safety, but ultimately, safety is of the Lord. And ultimately, that's really all you need is God looking out for you. So we need to make sure we don't get caught up in the mindset that Jacob had for a while of just, of just being so worried about his son that he didn't want to let him go anywhere or let him do anything just because something might happen to him. Now, of course, you know, bad events can, can change the way you think about things. He loved Joseph, and he let him go and do things, but then something bad happened, right? And now he's not going to, he decided, well, I'm not going to let that happen to Benjamin. But what he failed to realize is that God was with Joseph through all of that stuff. Now, he was given a lie and was told that Joseph was dead, but still, that, that, that faith... We need to keep that faith that God will keep our loved ones safe, that God will be there to protect us and that we can't always, you know, we're not always going to be around to do everything for your family. So I thought that's kind of interesting here, the way that he now has that hope of getting Simeon back too. Because he loves it. I believe that, that Jacob loves all of his children. He just has a certain order and favorites for sure. But he, he loves them all. He wants them all to, to, to come back to him and, you know, um, but let's keep reading here. So he has this attitude. He's like, fine. You know, if I be bereaved, then I'm bereaved. If, if the Lord decides to take my children, then I guess I just won't have them. And he, and he finally kind of gives up. And uh, let's keep reading. Verse 15. And the men took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home, and slay and make ready. For these men shall dine with me at noon. So Joseph sees them coming, and he sees that Benjamin's there. So he's saying, okay, good, they're going to eat with me now. And he, they're doing what he had told them to do. And he sets up this big feast. So he's saying, like, you know, kill an animal, get it all prepared. At noon, I'm going to be here, and we're going to have lunch. And um, that's what he tells his servant. So in verse 17, it says, And the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time how we brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen and our asses. So now they're worried that they're being brought into Joseph's house because they don't know what's going on. They're, they're doing what they were told to do, but they're still just there to, you know, to buy the bread and stuff. And when they come, they're greeted and say, oh yeah, yeah, come with me. And he brings them like into Joseph's house. They're thinking, why, are, you know, they're thinking it's a trap. They're thinking they're being set up and that now they're just all going to be his servants and it's not looking good for them. They're, they're afraid of this. Verse 19, And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house and they communed with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food and it came to pass when we came to the inn that we opened our sacks and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack and our money in full weight and we have brought it again in our hand. So they, they see this other guy, this other servant, you know, in, in the house and they, they go up to him real quick because they're, they're all worried what's going to happen to him. They're like, look, this is what happened. Let me explain the whole story to you. You know, we, we, we came, we bought our food and then when we, when we left, we got to the inn, we realized we all had our money. I said, we don't know how it got there, but that's what happened. So look, we brought, we brought our money again. We brought it here. Look, we're willing to make this good. We're willing to pay you. I don't, we don't know what happened, but here's the money. And it says in verse 23, he answered them and he said, Peace be to you. Fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sex. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. So now they're got, they've got to have this huge sigh of relief at this point. Because he's saying, no, you're clear. They're like, don't worry about that. I had your money. You know, God must have, must have blessed you and given you that money. But, I, but, but you paid for your food. You know, we don't think that you stole that food. So they, they, now they're thinking, okay, well, that's cool. Now, now they don't have that to worry about. And then he brings their brother out. He brings Simeon out unto them. So now they're all rejoined. So now they have a lot more confidence and think, okay, well, this is great now because obviously they released our brother unto us and they don't think that we stole the money, which is their main concern. And um, verse 24 says, And the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their asses provender 
and they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. And we were seeing him bowing themselves again as Joseph dreamed. Now, um, let's keep reading here. Verse 27. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spake? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on the bread. And so now we see he's still playing his part. Right? He's still acting. He knows all of his brethren, but they still don't know who he is. So he has to ask, is this your younger brother, the one who told, you told me about? He knows full well who it is. He knows it's his brother. He knows it's Benjamin. He sees him and he's like, you know, this is his brother. Joseph's been through all of this hard time, all of these problems, and this is his blood brother, and this is the brother that didn't betray him. You know, all of the other brothers can, you know, were... were can be held accountable to one degree or another of, of, of having given him up. But he didn't. And, and you know, of course, Benjamin is, is well beloved of Joseph, and Joseph's gone through all this stuff, and he sees him now, and it's hard to imagine, you know, the emotion that he's feeling, and he's trying to put on this, he's trying to act this person, and, you know, and, and being kind of a rough guy and dealing with them roughly, and he sees his brother. And all he really wants to do is go and probably just embrace him and hug him. Just like, man, it's so good to see you. you know, and, and after being apart for so many years and seeing him, and he kind of breaks down. He is, you know, it, it says his bowels yearn upon him. He's like, he just really was getting emotional at seeing his brother. So he had to get out of there pretty quickly and just, and just kind of break down and cry. Because he, you know, he has wept. Just, just this over flooding of emotion at seeing his brother and he has to go and hide him because he doesn't want to give up who he is yet. He still has a, has a purpose in, in playing out this role and not letting on to who he is quite yet. And um, it's, you know, it's going to come to an end real soon. But we see him here. He's still, he's still trying to maintain being a stranger unto them. So he has to go. He's got to go hide himself so he could, he could weep a little bit, let, let out some tears. And, and then get, his, get himself back together, you know, wash his face, go back out to his brethren and, and be presentable again unto his brethren. And he says, it says in, uh, and then he comes back out, you know, he says, set on bread. So they, they start to lunch. Verse 32 says, and they set on for him by himself. So Joseph's got a place all to himself. You know, they're all in the same room. Like he's got his own table. Joseph's eaten. And for them by themselves... So his brothers all are eaten in one place. Joseph's in one. And for the Egyptians, which did eat with him by themselves. So you've got these three different locations of people sitting down to eat lunch. And it says, Because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. So we see here the reason why they're, they're kept separate is because the Egyptians don't eat with the Hebrews. It's an abomination unto them. And, you know, we see here, I think this is a little interesting too, that, you know, all throughout history, you'll find racism in all peoples. All people upon the earth. It doesn't matter where you go. Racism has always existed in the world where there's people have always thought that they're better than another group of people. Not every person, but just in general groups of people. You, know, you have white people who are racist against black people. You have black people who are racist against white people. You have you know, brown people who are racist against red people, whatever. You know, there's people all throughout history. And here, I mean, in Egypt, Egyptians are typically really dark skinned. You know, Egypt, Africa, you have, you have this you know, dark skinned people who are, who are saying, thinking that they're better. It's an abomination for us to eat with, with these lowly Hebrews is the way that they thought. And I'm sure it wasn't just the Hebrews, it was probably other people too. I mean, they had this attitude of them being superior, being a superior race or whatever. And, um, you know, being linked in with the gods and all their false Baal worship and God worship that they had. And, um, but this is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. 
It's been in all cultures, been throughout history. People have thought that they're better than others. And even the Jews. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. We'll see this with the Jews. It's, it's, it's everybody. You know, nowadays, people say, oh, everybody's racist against the Jews. You know, you're anti-Semitic and all this other stuff. Or, um, you know, and, and they play the, the sympathy card and say, well, if you say anything negative against a Jew, then you're just anti-Semitic. You're racist. You hate them. Look. I'm not racist. You know, the Bible doesn't teach racism either. I just think it's interesting here. We see, you know, the, the Egyptians are racist against the Hebrews. The Hebrews are racist against the Gentiles. You have it all throughout history, all throughout cult, different cultures, and all throughout uh, the world. People have been racist against people that don't look like them, that don't act like them, that are different from them, and live, you know, live somewhere else. It, it's, it, it happens all throughout history. It's not right, but it happens. Look at Acts 10, verse 28. Acts 10, 28 says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. This is when Peter had that vision of the, the basket coming down from heaven with a, you know, like, a, like a big balloon, like a, kind of like a hot air balloon coming down with all these different animals. And he says, take, Peter, you know, slay and eat. And there's all these unclean beasts in the, in the basket. He's saying, not so, Lord. You know, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. In the vision, you know, in the vision, God says, you know, that what God has cleansed, that call not thou common or unclean. And, you know, it happens three times. And then he gets called to go unto, you know, this guy's house and he goes unto the Gentiles and he preaches the gospel unto them. He's called, you know, the Holy Spirit lets, you know, go with these people. This is of God. You need to go here. You need to preach to them. So he finally realizes what the, you know, what his vision is about, that it's not about the animals so much as it's about the people. He's saying, look, he says, you know, it's an unlawful thing for a man that's a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. He says, it's unlawful for me to be going and these are the Jews' laws. This isn't, this isn't God's law, by the way. The unlawful thing, it's not that it's just against God's law to sit down and eat dinner with someone from another nation. It's not. It never has been. That's never been part of the law. Now, the one thing that was is they weren't supposed to take heathen wives, wives of the, of the men of these other nations. That was forbidden, but there was, you know, that's so they don't turn their heart away from God because they're heathen because they serve false gods. It's always been allowed for people of other nations to come and make themselves a Jew, regardless of where they're from or their color or their race, whatever it is. And, you know, and race is stupid anyways. There's one race called the human race. But whatever, you know, wherever they're from, they were allowed to integrate themselves with the Jews and, be, and, and worship the Lord and change their religion and become part of, that, part of the Jews. That was always been allowed in the Old Testament. And now we see here that they've made they their man-made rules where it's unlawful for a Jew to keep company from one of another nation, which didn't we just see that with the Egyptians? Oh, it's an abomination for us to eat with the Hebrews. Well, late, you know, thousands of years later, we see the Jews doing the exact same thing to other people. And then uh, jump down to verse 34. The Bible reads, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. God's not a respecter of persons. God doesn't care where you're from. God doesn't care who your parents were. God doesn't care what region of the globe you were born in. It doesn't matter what continent you were born in. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. God is not a respecter of persons. God doesn't care if you're physically of the seed of Abraham. God is able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. That's what John the Baptist said to the Pharisees who were trusting in the fact that they were, you know, thinking that they were some special chosen race, some special chosen people, just because they were physically a descendant of Abraham. It meant nothing. Faith is what matters. That is the difference between you know, uh, whether or not God is going to respect you. He's not a respecter of persons. In that sense, he'll, he's going to accept you when you put your faith in him. And that's all that matters. And that's the way it's always been. You know, uh, racism has always existed, but it's never been right. And I don't care if you, if you think, you know, there's a lot of Christians that think that, that are racist in the sense that they think Jews are special. 
that the physical seed of Israel is somehow special or more important than anybody else. And it's nonsense. I mean, the Bible couldn't be more clear about the fact that it doesn't matter. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. It doesn't matter if you're a man. It doesn't matter if you're a woman. It doesn't matter where you were born or who you're descended from. It matters not. Avoid genealogies. You don't need them. It doesn't matter because God's not a respecter of persons. But, you know, as it has happened throughout all history, turn if you would to Acts 17, my last, my last point, because I just want you to see these scriptures. I mean, this, this is scriptural. Racism is not scriptural. Acts 17, look at verse number 24. The Bible reads it, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God's made all the nations of the earth of one blood. We've all got the same blood. It all started with Adam and Eve. The blood that, that was running through their veins has passed down for all nations, for all generations, for all people. The outward appearance means nothing. He's made all nations of one blood. And that's what he's stressing here as being important. Let's, uh, let's finish up the chapter. We're almost done. Uh, 43, so we see, you know, they're, they're sitting in their own little tables, their own sections, kind of like in high school, you, you know, you had the cool kids, you had the nerds, you had the jocks, you know, you had all the, the, the segregation going on. Well, they had the segregation here. Joseph, of course, was the man, so he's just all by himself. And then, and then the Hebrews, his brethren, were, were sitting over by themselves, and of course the Egyptians were sitting by themselves. And, you know, notice the Egyptians didn't sit with Joseph either. I don't know for sure if it was just because of Joseph's position, but definitely Joseph was a Hebrew too. And they knew that, but, you know, and it shows a little bit of hypocrisy too. It definitely shows the hypocrisy that they think it's an abomination to eat with the Hebrews, but we're going to set a Hebrew over everybody in the land. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that doesn't make any sense at all. They, um, they, they knew that he was a prisoner before, you know, when Pharaoh set him up, and they have all their... They're, they're racist laws and stuff, but that's just for the common folk. But, you know, like Joseph's exempted from that, and it's just total hypocrisy. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but racism doesn't make any sense. So let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Verse 33, And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled one at another. So he sets them up to eat in their birth order. And they, obviously they, they realize this because they marveled one another. It's like, wow, that's kind of weird. You know, how could he possibly know this? I mean, they were they're grown men. How would you know? How do you know, like, if, uh, you know, especially being born from different, different mothers and stuff, probably at different times, or close, maybe similar times together, and someone's in their 40s, you know, if, if maybe a few of them are in their 40s, how are you going to tell exactly who's the older one? You're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to, know. No, no random person is going to be like, oh, yeah, you're the oldest, then you, then you, then you, you know, like in the, in the exact order. But he was able to do that because they're his brothers. He knows, he knows how old they are. And, and he sets them in order. And they marvel at one another. It says in verse 34, And he took and sent messes unto them from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. So he, he's getting, now he's given a lot of special attention to Benjamin. Benjamin's the one he wanted to see. Benjamin, the one who, who he was yearning upon, you know, and he had to go and excuse himself so he could just weep because he has so much emotion. Benjamin's the one that he really loves. It's his, it's his full brother. So now he's going to bless him. You know, he gets, you know, I could just see, you know, everyone's sitting at, the, at their table eating their food. And then Benjamin just got all this food all stacked up and all the best stuff. And that's what he did. So he's blessing Benjamin. And uh, we're going to see how the story plays out next week. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for these great stories in the Bible, dear Lord. I pray that you'll please help us to continue to learn from the story of Joseph and his brethren, dear Lord, and that you would teach us more great truths out of the Bible, and you'd help us to um, be diligent in reading and be diligent in studying and learning, dear God, that um, 
we can make the applications necessary in our life. Lord, help us not to make foolish statements um, like promises or vows or, or things that, um, of that nature, dear Lord, and making ourselves surety for somebody else that we can just show wisdom and not get ourselves involved in those, in those situations that, that ultimately just won't turn out good for us, dear Lord, that we can, we can be wise and not get ourselves entangled in a, in a mess, dear Lord. Um, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.